Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 7 in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar. Chapter 7 is on external forced convection and it addresses uh, heat transfer forced convection over flat plates, uh, cylinders and spheres and tube banks. Uh, in terms of the first paragraph, drag and heat transfer, again like the previous chapter there's a lot of revision of fluid mechanics which I'm not going to do in detail. Specifically you'll see the drag part will always come out and then we will give the analogy in terms of the heat transfer. You've also seen it in the previous chapter when we've looked at the analogy between momentum transfer and heat transfer. Okay, but the important thing is that the drag coefficient can be written as the drag force divided by half rho v squared multiplied by a and this drag coefficient is the drag coefficient of friction and the drag coefficient of the pressure profile the pressure drag that's normally the combination of the two you have to be careful for the surface area which is being used the velocity is always the free stream velocity, that velocity there. But this object can be a flat plate, it can be something like an aeroplane wing, it can be something like a motor car or anything like that. It can be different things. So the case of the flat plate is the easy case because the pressure distribution on this side and from that side would be exactly the same, so that part would be negligible something like an aeroplane wing that is generating lift. The pressure distribution is actually what is causing the lift, but it contributes to the drag. So therefore that needs to be taken into consideration. The same with a motor car. The pressure drag will play a role. It is not only the friction drag. The important thing is the surface area. Normally, when you get this drag coefficient in tables or graphs or wherever, it is based on a certain area or dimension. On a flat plate, it is always based on the area of the plate, only one side. If it's an aeroplane wing, it can be, depending on that, how that was generated, that can be only the, the profile if you look at it from the frontal area, or in the same with a car, you know, uh, a car um, can be, if you look at something like that, the, for, the car from the front, it can be that, that area, and in some cases it can be the total area. So you have to be very careful, it is always based on an area, and you have to make sure which area is being used. Now the analogy with heat transfer is, where previous in, in, in fluid mechanics we look at the drag coefficient, here we look at the Nusselt numbers, and the Nusselt numbers, x, which means it's a local Nusselt number, is a function on a non-dimensionalized x. A Reynolds number, which will be local as well as the Prandtl number. Now, with any body like that, <coughs> that would mean that the heat transfer rate at that point and that point and another point might all differ. Because okay. if we would go and plot the heat transfer coefficient, that would now be for the top and that would be for the bottom, the heat transfer coefficients can do something like that. And depending on the magnitude of the heat transfer coefficient, that will determine the drag, and that is why we indicate this x, because the x is the non-dimensionalized distance. In many cases, this is not a good engineering solution. We as engineers are a little bit lazy. We would like other people to do the hard work for us, and for that reason, we rather use the average Nusselt number, and that would then be the average Nusselt number for the whole body, not at a local specific point, and then normally we would write it as the Reynolds number based on a characteristic length. Maybe in this case it can be that characteristic length there. But it can also be a 
projected length, the width, or even the height. That can also be the characteristic length. It just depends on how it was prepared and how it was presented to you. But normally, we will do all the hard work, or people doing the experiments will do all the hard work. They will do the integration for us so that we can end up with an equation which says the Nusselt number is a constant multiplied by the Reynolds number based on the length multiplied by the Prandtl number to the n. And that would be to the m there. And m and n in c are the things which would typically vary and would be the things that we need to get from tables or graphs. Something that is, however, important is if this is the surface, which is at the temperature Ts, and this is the free stream velocity and temperature, the Prandtl number is equal to Cp multiplied by the viscosity divided by the thermal conductivity, and these are all dependent on the fluid which is being used. If it's air, oil, whatever, and it is dependent on temperature. So the question is which temperature should we use? And the answer is that normally what we do is we define the film temperature, Tf, which is equal to the free stream temperature plus the surface temperature divided by two, and we would get the properties of the fluid at the film temperature. It might be that a problem is asked to you that everything is given and surface temperature is not given. So that's an unknown. That is the thing that you must determine. What do you do then? Well, you would use the properties you would start with using the properties of a temperature that you know, that temperature. You would go through the calculation, you would determine Ts, and then you would just recalculate your film temperature, get the revised properties, and do the calculation again. So normally you don't have to iterate more than two times. It will converge very, very quickly. Okay, so that is one way of how the fluid properties can be handled. The other way, which is more sophisticated, which we are not going to do, is that we can, you can take the Nusselt number and you can multiply it by Prandtl infinite to Prandtl on the wall, on the surface, to the R. You obviously, we need to know what R is. So you can do it like that, or you can take the Nusselt number and you can multiply it by the viscosity ratio again of the free stream divided by the surface to the power of R. Those are modifications which are being used in heat transfer to take into consideration the changes in properties. In terms of getting to this CD value here, you would know that if you've got something like an aeroplane wing, and that is the free stream velocity, and you would go and plot the CF value over the profile, then it would look maybe at something like that in terms of the local CF values. But in general, we are more interested in calculating the average. So somebody must go and do the integration for us of CF x dx. So any drag coefficient of most profiles would typically look like something like this. That, would, that might be the friction coefficient drag. And here we can maybe plot the pressure one, and the pressure one can maybe look something like that. But somebody needs to do the integration. Once you've done the integration, you can end up with one value for a specific geometry. Now the same is being done in heat transfer. As I've showed here, this is the heat transfer coefficient that varies over the object. Then the average can be determined as over the total length integrate from 0 to L of the local values dx. So you can see the analogy is exactly the same. <coughs> A 
And once we've got this average heat transfer coefficient, then we can get the total heat transfer rate. Total is then equal to the heat transfer rate, heat transfer coefficient, multiplied by the area, the surface temperature minus the free stream temperature. This is just as an introduction, again, mostly from the fluid mechanics, just connecting the heat transfer to, to show you that we do it in a similar way. Paragraph 7.2 is now specifically a flat plate. Now for the flat plate, you've already done it in fluid mechanics, and we've already revised it. If this is the flat plate and you've got flow over the flat plate, so if that is the flat plate there, that would be x and that would be equal to y. Then the velocity boundary layer, and that is why I'm using the blue part now, is going to do something like that. This is the laminar part. This is the transition part. And this is the turbulent part. Now where transition occurs, that is known as X critical. XCR. This is where the transition would start. And the transition at XCR, that would be a function of, firstly, the geometry of the object. It would be a function of epsilon divided by d, the surface roughness, or epsilon divided by l in this case. It would be a function of the velocity, the surface temperature, and the type of fluid. So all those things will have an influence on where transition starts. How do we determine transition? Well, we make use of the Reynolds number, the local Reynolds number, which would be equal to rho Vx divided by the viscosity. Rho and the viscosity are properties of the fluid at the film temperature. V is the free stream velocity, and what is x? x is just the distance measured from the leading edge of the plate. You can also write it as V multiplied by X divided by that symbol for the viscosity, the kinematic viscosity, where the kinematic viscosity is equal to the normal viscosity divided by the density. Now for a flat plate, transition would occur typically from one 100,000 to 1 million, uh, to one, yeah, to a million. That is the range in which transition occurs. Now what we're going to do in this module is we are going to choose 500,000. 500,000 we're going to choose. So if the Reynolds number is smaller than 500,000, the flow is laminar. If it's larger than 500,000, the flow is turbulent. What we're also going to do is we are going to consider this flat plate, and we are not going to look at the start of transition and the end of transition. We are going to simplify it and say that there's a transition from laminar to turbulent, and that is it. There's laminar, there's turbulent, and th that's where the transition begins and ends, and that would be where the critical Reynolds number is equal to 500,000. So x is measured from there, and that distance is x critical.
Okay, now in the previous chapter, you've already seen that if we look at the friction coefficients for friction coefficients, take note, L is for laminar flow. So I'm not going to write out laminar every time. For laminar flow, the boundary layer thickness is equal to 4.91x divided by Reynolds x, the square root of it. That's the boundary layer thickness and the friction coefficient is equal to 0.664 divided by the square root of Reynolds x, the local Reynolds number. That's for laminar flow. Laminar flow, the Reynolds number is smaller than 500,000. For turbulent flow, that is what this T is for. For turbulent flow, the boundary layer thickness is equal to 0.38x divided by Reynolds x to the fifth. Reynolds x to the fifth. Boundary layer thickness is 0.38 multiplied by x divided by Reynolds x to the fifth. And the friction coefficient is equal to 0.059 divided by Reynolds x to the fifth. I think I forgot to put an X in my notes there, you can just check, something like that. Right, and again, if that is the plate that we consider with the free stream velocity like that, then the CF values is going to do something like that, then something like that, and then again something like that. Okay. So again, this is where transition would start. So we've got laminar flow, transition flow, and turbulent. And this is CFX. Typically that is how the graph will look like. Now the very beautiful thing in, 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 in nature is if that is CFX and we would go and measure the heat, local heat transfer coefficients, the graphs would do exactly the same. The magnitudes would not be the same, but the tendencies would be exactly the same. Now if somebody did go and do these measurements and do the integration for us, then for laminar flow, CF is equal to 1.33 divided by Reynolds based on the length to a half. So I want to, I want to explain now. So this is the CFX value. So this equation, this is laminar flow. So you can use this equation at that point, let's suppose 100 millimeters from there, and you can go and calculate the CFX value, the local skin friction coefficient. And then you can go and do it everywhere because it's a function of X. Whoops, I think, sorry, there must be an X. Or it is in any case in that Reynolds number. So you can go and calculate all those values. And then you're going to integrate it. Integration is the area underneath the graph divided by the length. And this would be the result of the average friction coefficient over the length of the plate where the flow is laminar. The same for turbulent flow. For turbulent flow, the CF value is equal to 0.074 divided by Reynolds L to the fifth. 
and this would be for the case of turbulent flow over the entire length of a plate. Now this is very confusing to students. Okay. So this is for turbulent flow over the entire length of the plate. I will come back to it a little bit later. So that is now for laminar flow and that would be for turbulent flow if everything is turbulent. Now we would like to look at a case where a part of the flow is laminar and a part is turbulent. Okay, how would, how would we get the CF then? We will get it as the integration from over the length of the plate from zero to x critical of CFx dx plus the integration from x critical to the length of CFx dx. Okay. So it's the laminar part plus the turbulent part. And if we do this, then we can determine the CA value as 0.074 divided by the Reynolds based on the length of, to the fifth minus 1742 divided by Reynolds L. And exactly the same can be done for the heat transfer. So we look at the local values for the laminar flow. We use this equation for the local values in the turbulent flow. All those values. We do the integration and then we end up with that equation in terms of putting the two then together for the laminar part and the turbulent part then ending up with this equation. Now the same can be done for the heat transfer. For laminar flow, the missile based on X is equal to 0 0.332 Reynolds X to the 0 0.5 Prandtl to the third. And you'll see it is valid for Prandtl numbers larger than 0.6 because the flow is laminar Reynolds numbers must be smaller than 500,000 <coughs> then for turbulent flow the Nusselt number x is equal to 0.0296 Reynolds x to the 0.8 Brandl to the third Again, the local values for laminar and turbulent. Then we can go and determine the average values, which would then be over the total length of the plate. Again, for laminar flow, the Nusselt number is equal to 0.664 Reynolds L to the 0.5 Pronel to the third. And for turbulent flow, it would be equal to 0 0.037 Reynolds L to 0 0.8 Brondel to the third. And this would be for the case over the, the entire plate. Over the entire plate. If you can't read this over the entire plate. It must be turbulent over the entire plate. Okay, something that you should take note of is, is typically this. You'll see that it's a factor 2 and 
If you really go and analyze it in terms of the heat transfer coefficient as a function of x, and if you would go and look at the local values, so that would be at the length L, so that would be the heat transfer coefficient where x is equal to L, then what it actually means is that the average heat transfer coefficient, that is why I'm using that thing to indicate it's the average, if you would go and do the integration of this area and you do divide it by the length, that would be that average. That average is always two times the local value at L. So if you've got that value, you can just multiply it by two to get the average heat transfer coefficient over the total plate. Okay, so as we've done in terms of with the friction coefficient, by looking at the integration over the laminar part and the turbulent part, the same can be done here, and the result would be an equation that looks like this. Nusselt number is equal to 0 0.037 multiplied by the Reynolds based on the length to the 0.8 minus 871, everything multiplied by Prandtl to a third, and that is equation 724 in your textbook. Just a paragraph in your textbook is about liquid metals. So LM is just liquid metals. For liquid metals, other equa another equation is given that can be used, and the equation is written as a function of the piclet number. The piclet number, and the piclet number is just equal to the Reynolds number multiplied by the Prandtl number. After the liquid metals, in your textbook, if that is a flat, flat plate, then the interesting case is considered where the first part of the plate is not heated, which means that the velocity boundary layer would start developing from there. That would be the velocity boundary layer. And because we've got this first part, which is not heated, the thermal boundary layer will only start developing there. That is the thermal boundary layer, and equations are also given for that case. There's also in the textbook a part where a uniform heat flux is considered. So up to now, we've always looked at the flat plate at temperature Ts. Now the case is considered where the heat flux is a constant. So the heat transfer rate would actually do something like that. And if that is equal to T infinite, and we would look at the temperature then there will be a certain temperature there, which would be lower than T infinite. Oh, uh, sorry, not T. Uh, that is T. And then there would be T infinite. If we look at the temperature there, it would be higher than, than T infinite because it is being heated. So the temperature of the fluid would typically increase linearly along the surface and the surface temperature would also do something like that. So if, if it is immediately fully developed, the surface temperature is going to do something like that, and the fluid temperature is going to do something like that. Just another set of equations for another boundary condition. Okay, so it's a little bit of a boring lecture, lots of equations which we suddenly 
dump on you. The important thing is if you just revise the fluid mechanics once, then you will see that for all the fluid mechanics once, there are now heat transfer once that gives you the Nusselt numbers, where the previous equations would give you the, the, the CA values, now you would get the Nusselt numbers. Let's look at an example. <coughs> Let's look at a plate, and the length of the plate is 5 meters, and oil flow over this plate, and it is at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, the velocity is 2 meters per second, and yeah. So the temperature is 60, the velocity is 2 meters per second, it's engine oil, I'm just going to write oil, this is 5 meters in length, that is the surface temperature of the plate which is 20 degrees Celsius, and we must determine the drag on the plate and the heat transfer rate. Now they do not give the width of the plate, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume the width is 1 meters. So that W is equal to 1, 1 meter. And we have to determine the drag and the heat transfer rate. As I've discussed with you, we need to determine the film temperature, which will be the average of the oil temperature and the plate temperature, which is 60 plus 2 divided by 2. That is equal to 40 degrees Celsius. So for engine oil, that is in table A13 in your textbook, we can get that the density of the oil is 876 kilograms per cubic meters. The Prandtl number is equal to 2962. Prandtl numbers of oils are very high. The thermal conductivity is equal to 0.1444 watts per meter Kelvin. And the kinematic viscosity is equal to 2.485 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4 square meters per second. If you can't read these values, I'm just, I will repeat them just now. The density is 876 kilograms per cubic meters. The Prandtl number is 2962. Thermal conductivity 0.1444 watts per meter Kelvin. The kinematic viscosity 2.485 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4 square meters per second. Right. So if we've got a problem like that, as you can see, what is important, it is important to know, is the flow laminar or turbulent. How do we determine that? With the Reynolds number. So let's use the Reynolds number. And we use it on the total length of 5 meters. So the Reynolds number is equal to VL divided by kinematic viscosity is equal to 2 multiplied by 5 divided by the viscosity is 2.485 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. The Reynolds number works out as 4.024 multiplied by 10 to the 4, which means the flow is laminar. It is smaller than 5 multiplied by 10 to the 5. So we've got laminar flow. It's important to know this because if this is our length of our plate, which is now 5 meters, it means that the boundary layer is going to develop, 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 and the plate needs to be longer with about at least 25% 
before it will go into transition. So everything that we are going to consider is laminar flow. That's the easiest case. Okay? It's laminar flow. So CF for laminar flow average is 1.33, Reynolds L to the minus 0.5. There's the Reynolds number, you can just plug it in there and you can calculate the CA value as 0 0.00663. So that would be the average friction coefficient. Some people to prefer to put something like that on to indicate it's the average value. As you can see it is based on the length. You can also put an L there to indicate it's based on the total length. The drag force is then going to be CF multiplied by the surface area, rho v squared divided by 2. The CF value we've calculated just now is 0 0.00663. The area of the plate will be 5 multiplied by 1. They didn't give us the width of the plate. So for that reason, we assume it is one meters. Okay. And then you can add all the other values there, the density, the velocity, and the two. Complete the calculation, and then it would be 58.1 newtons. But remember, it is for a width of one meter. So it is per unit width. If the width is 10 meters, then the total drag force would be 580 newtons. If it's only 100 millimeters, then it would be 5.8 newtons. The missile number, the average missile number based on the length is 0.664 Reynolds L to the 0.5, Prandtl to the third, and that would be equal to 1913. The missile number is equal to HL divided by K, which is equal to 1913. The length we have is 5 meters, the thermal conductivity is 0 0.144, so we can go and calculate the average heat transfer coefficient is equal to 55.25 watts per square meter degree Celsius. And now that we've got the heat transfer rate, we can determine oh, the heat transfer coefficient, we can determine the heat transfer rate. The heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. Normally we would write Ts minus T infinite, but in this case the oil is at a lower temperature than that of the surface, so I just write it the other way around. So the heat transfer coefficient is 55.25. The surface area, again, based on the width of 1 meters, is 5 multiplied by 1. Multiplied by the temperature difference is 60 minus 20. And the result is an answer of 11,050 watts. Please do not give me an answer like that in the tests and exams. This is equal to 11.1 .1 kilowatts and it would be per unit width. Per unit width. So if the width of the plate is 10 meters, we need to multiply that by 10 and then it would be 111 kilowatts. Okay, you understand? Okay, now the thing that I've said that many of you will have problems with and that is these two equations which are valid over the total length. Because if you go and think about it, 
that would actually never, never happen because the boundary layer must always start developing. So when are you going to use those equations? And I'm going to number these equations, so uh, let's use, say this is equation A, and this is equation B, and this one is equation C. Okay. So the case where the flow Everything was laminar, we've just done as an example. In many cases, if now, if we take that same problem of the oil, and we would change the length, not to 5 meters, but 30 meters. Okay. Then you're going to say, I would like to know where transition will occur. And then you're going to use here a value of 5 multiplied by 10 to the 5. It's a function of x critical, and you're going to calculate x critical. Now let's suppose x critical is 15 meters. This is just an example. Okay. So 15 meters. So it means that the first half would be laminar flow and the second half would be turbulent flow. Do you agree? Okay. So the question is now in terms of the equations, which equation will I use to determine the heat transfer rate and also the CF value? So I'm going to use this equation also, I'm also going to number this as also C. Okay. So because we've got a laminar part and because we've got a turbulent part, I will use equation C's. To solve CF and the heat transfer coefficient. And I think it's quite logically, isn't it? Because we've got a laminar part and we've got a turbulent part. You agree? However, let's suppose we look at the same problem and now the length of the plate is 30,000 meters. It's a little bit it's not really realistic because we do not normally have such long plates but let's just as an example I'm just I just want to make a point so previously we've calculated that transition will occur at 15 meters now if we look at this total length the 15 meters the transition is going to occur there you agree on a scale it's almost at the leading edge. It's a good engineering assumption, isn't it? So in this case, you're going to say it's turbulent over the entire length. Because the laminar part is negligible. Okay. Now we can keep on pushing in terms of when is negligible and many of us will have different criteria. What would I personally use? 10%. So I would say if the transition occurs in the first 10%, I will assume the entire flow is turbulent. If the entire flow is turbulent, then I can rather use equation A and B.
Why? Because it's for somebody who's as lazy as I am. It's easier and quicker to do it. If you always want to be right, then you can make use of the combined equation C, which just has an extra term that you need to calculate for each one of the CF and Nusselt number values. Is that clear to you? Right, thank you ladies and gentlemen.